So if you recall where we left off last time, we've been talking about the common fork join pool, and I talked a little bit about the role it played in parallel streams. What we're going to do today is we're going to show how parallel streams as a functional programming abstraction is mapped onto the underlying common fork join pool framework by the streams framework, the streams implementation. So this is just a recap of what we talked about last time. If you've got a parallel stream like this where things need to get broken up into chunks and then mapped onto the underlying fork join pool, that's what the parallel streams framework does. And actually, it's, it's the streams framework when you have a parallel stream. Uh, and so it's going to end up creating these fork join tasks that are going to be run by the worker threads in the common fork join pool. So if you take a look at this, and when we get into the fork join pool discussion later in class, probably starting next week, you'll get a much deeper understanding of this. But at a high level, what you've got is you've got these worker threads that are running in the common fork join pool. And they just sit there kind of scanning for tasks to compute. <clears throat> so you can think of them as like, uh, like I show here with my gerbil wheel, kind of running, looking for work to do, pulling stuff out of the pool, and, and processing stuff in the pool. Why do they work this way? The whole purpose is to try to keep the worker threads and, of course, the underlying processor cores as busy as possible. The whole point of this is to make the system maximally utilize the available computing resources, which is a good thing to do, not a bad idea. The way this works internally, and again, we'll go into this in much more detail later, but a high-level view is that each worker thread has a so-called double-ended queue, also known as a DEC. DEC stands for double-ended queue that serves as its main source of tasks. So let's assume, for sake of argument, that there's three threads in the pool of worker threads. And that, of course, will be a function of how many cores you've got. So we'll have some threads in the uh, pool. And each of the threads has its own deck, which is called a work queue, for reasons that will become clear when we talk more about the fork join pool. And each of the decks has a bunch of tasks, which are really subtasks, to work on. So let's assume at any given point in time, things look like this. So this thread has four things in its work queue, four tasks in its work queue, its work deck. This one has none at the moment, and this one has a couple. Now remember, the characteristic of a deck is you can put things onto the front, you can take things off the front, you can put things on the rear, you can take things off the rear. So it's a double-ended queue. That's what it means to be a, a deck. So the way this works under the hood, then, is the streams framework has this class called the abstract class. And it's a super class that's meant to be customized by other parts of the framework. And it's used to implement the parallel streams framework. So the abstract class, abstract task class, is used to manage the splitting and the processing of tasks. And tasks are the things that are going to be put onto these work queues in order to be able to do the processing of different parts of the input that has been broken up into chunks kind of going back to what a splitterator does. And you'll see here in a second, this is where the splitterator actually gets used by the parallel streams framework. So this abstract task is actually a fork join task. We'll talk more about that later. So it's meant to be used with the fork join pool. And as we'll also see later when we talk about the fork join pool tasks, there's a method called compute. And this is actually something called a recursive task. We'll talk more about that as well. So there's a compute method. And the compute method, the purpose of the compute method in the fork join pool framework is to figure out whether to compute the work in the task directly, because maybe it's reached a point where it's small enough that it can be run atomically in one of the worker threads in the pool, or whether it should split things up and then fork. So that's the job of compute, is to kind of, kind of make those determinations. And so what this is going to do is it's going to keep calling try split. Try split is the splitterator. And it's going to have a loop, and it's going to keep calling try split until try split returns null. Now remember from your try split implementation for the array splitterator that you did, you return null when you can't split it any further. And otherwise, you keep splitting it in half. And then one half works on, or one object works on the, the right-hand side of the split. And then you create a new splitterator object to work on the left-hand side of the split. So that's what try split's going to do. So while we haven't reached the point where there's nothing else to split, we're going to split. We're going to store 
this. So you see you have RS, which stands for right-hand side, and LS, which stands for left-hand side. And so we split things up, and then we're going to have a little Boolean flag that we're going to set back and forth in order to be able to decide which side to split next. And this is meant to avoid so-called biased splitterators, where it splits things in a way that will be unbalanced. So if we're going to be forking the right side, then we set right fork to false so that next time we'll uh, fork the left side. If we're forking the left side, we would set the fork right to true, so we'll fork the right side next time. And then we go ahead and we set the task to fork. Uh, let's see, the task to fork is just a, uh, here, it's a, a task. Task to fork, which is either going to be the right child or the left child, as you can see, right hand side, left hand side. And then down here, we're going to go ahead and fork the appropriate task. Now what fork does is fork is going to go ahead and push the tasks that we're trying to fork onto the current, the calling threads deck. So remember, this is the deck back over here. So whoever's doing this stuff, that task will be pushed onto the front. When you fork, you push it onto the front of the deck, which means it's the next thing that will be processed when there's something to do. So what will happen there is we push a new subtask, and then we're going to continue processing the other side, whichever side was not the side we just pushed and forked. That'll get processed in the loop. So what we're doing here is we're going through and we're forking things off and putting them onto the tasks, onto the, uh, the decks. The tasks are being put onto the decks. Now, this will become a little bit more clear when we talk a little bit more about what's happening underneath the, the hood, which I'll do in a second. And then what we're going to do here is we're going to do the leaf processing once all this stuff is done. And that will typically call for each remaining, which will process all the remaining elements in the stream sequentially. So we fork everybody off. When we finally get a null, we then process everything that's left over in that task in a sequential manner. So here's what happens after the abstract task compute method calls fork. So just to step back here, when fork is called, let's say we're going to fork a task, here's what it looks like. And let's assume for sake of argument that we happen to be in this threads, uh, in this thread. That's the one that was doing the, the fork. So when fork is called, and this is where fork is called right here, that task is then pushed onto the deck of the calling thread. So the calling thread will push the, or the thread in which this thing is running in, where fork is called, we'll go ahead and push that subtask into its work queue. So now it's on that work queue. And then when that worker thread doesn't have anything else to do, when it's done splitting, it'll go ahead and pop the next item off the front of its work queue and then join with it. Or rather, sorry, when join is called, it'll go ahead and pop, and then it'll go ahead and process in that thread. So each worker thread processes the deck it manages in LIFO order, last in, first out. So it's basically a stack. And you'll see why that works that way in a second. So we push things on to the stack, and then we pop them off in the order, um, well, in reverse order from which they were pushed. So it's last in, first out. And once something is popped, then that is run to completion. So at that point, this thread will then finish off whatever's being done here in that subtask, which might be something like we just saw for each remaining. It'll go ahead and do the sequential processing. Now, here's the interesting part. Once we've, uh, oh, and, and why do we do LIFO? We do LIFO in order to improve locality of reference and caching. And the reason for this is the item you just put on the deck is the first one you're going to take off and process. So chances are it's got everything in its cache. So it's warm, it's ready to run, it's more optimized, and it'll just perform better. Now, here's the interesting part. If you get to a point where your deck is empty, because you've got done processing all of your work, then that's where the fork join pool does so-called work stealing. And what it's going to do is it's going to randomly look around at other threads' decks. So all the decks are actually available in sort of a global singleton-like object. So the different threads in the worker thread pool can get access to them. Normally, they work on their own deck. But when they've run out of work in their deck, 
they then say, I'm going to go steal work from somebody else's deck. And so they'll just randomly, it, it's intentionally done in a random way, so you don't always go try to steal the same, the same deck, the same deck's uh, tasks. So the different threads will kind of randomly scatter themselves around. And you go and see, is, is there someone else? Is there work in someone else's deck? And if so, you steal it from the end of the deck. So when you're working on your own deck, you take things from the front. So as you can see here, as you can see, we, we push and pop things on our own deck in LIFO order. But when we steal from somebody else's deck, we steal from the end. Yes, sir. Great question. So there's a couple different issues here. I think part of the, the root of your question is um, concurrency control. What happens if more than one thread tries to steal from the same deck? So as we'll see when we talk in more detail about how these things work, they have something called compare and swap, uh, mut mutual exclusion mechanisms, very efficient mutual exclusion mechanisms. So basically only one thread can go into that deck and steal it at a time. There's mutual exclusion. So if another thread randomly shows up at the same deck, whoever gets there first, whoever gets that compare and swap lock first will be the one to get it. Um, now the other part of your question, which is interesting, is what if there's no more work to do? What if Everybody's uh, got a, an empty deck. It's like you're not playing with a full deck, right? You're playing with an empty deck. So you've got nothing but empty decks. In that case, and only in that case, will the threads actually go to sleep. But as long as there's something left to steal, the threads will go steal it. And you've encountered this kind of stuff probably plenty of times if you fly. If you go to an airport, you'll often see a situation where um, they divide up the, the check-in uh, at the ticket gate where you go and check in, right? You, you drop your bags off and you check in. They usually have you know, first class, business class, and economy. And typically the way, the way that works is as long as there are people in first class, whoever's taking the tickets and checking the bags in for first class will service those people. When that queue gets empty, the people who are doing the checking in will typically then call for business class or call for coach or whatever. They'll, they'll pull from the other decks, pull from the other queues. And that's, again, designed to make sure that they're maximizing you know, throughput through the line. So these things are not at all unknown in everyday life. Um, they give priority to the things that are their deck, their queue, but then if those are empty, they'll pull from someplace else. So just to give you a sense. Did, did that answer your question? So we'll, we'll, and we'll talk a lot more about this later. I'm, I'm giving you a kind of a high level view now because we're talking about how this works for parallel streams. And I don't want to get too caught up in the implementation details, but I want you to see the big picture. We'll talk about the implementation details when we talk about fork join pool next. So we pull things off the end and then we run those things to completion. And by doing it this way, the whole goal is to try to maximize utilization and minimize contention. So you're trying to have a situation where you very rarely have to wait. Because the whole problem with multi-core processors is waiting. Whenever you're waiting, whenever you're sleeping, uh, really, really slow. So you're better off a lot of times sort of doing these compare and swap so-called busy waits or spin locks in order to be able to keep the core running. Even though you might busy wait a little bit, by the time you finally get what you need, it's, it's very fast. It's a lot faster than putting the whole thing to sleep and waking it up later. And we'll talk a lot more about that when we talk in detail about how fork joint pools work. OK, so any questions about that? So at a high level, the splitterators are used to split up the input into these chunks. And we saw the splitterator being used by this abstract tasks compute method. And then those things are forked. And by forking, they stick them on the queue of the current thread. And then other threads, if they don't have anything to do, will come and steal the work from the end of that queue. So often what will happen is you'll have one queue that will start out by you know, putting a bunch of stuff on its deck. And then it'll start working on its deck. But there'll be a bunch of other things on its deck. And the other threads in the pool will wake up and go, ha, there's, there's work to be stolen. And they'll go start to steal the work. And then the point of this is to balance the load across all the cores. The other thing to remember here is we don't really know in advance how long any one of these jobs is going to run. If we're lucky and we partition things in an even way, and the amount of work on each of the chunks is roughly the same, you'd expect them to be pretty well balanced. But for various reasons, it might take 
It might be the case that some chunks are bigger than other chunks. It might be the case that some chunks have data that takes longer to compute, or you have to do a network operation that takes longer to get access to some server on the moon rather than the server in the computer room next door. So in those cases, if you get unbalanced workloads, then some of these decks for some of the worker threads will get shorter and some of them will get longer. And that's the point of work stealing, is to try to balance out the processing so it's going to smooth out the processing and have a chance to keep the cores more utilized without having to know in advance how long each of the computations is going to run, and not assuming that the computations all run in exactly the same amount of time. OK, so that's the end of that discussion. We will come back and talk a lot more about how the common fork join pool works later. But I wanted you to see at a high level how the streams framework maps things onto the underlying common fork join pool.